everyone. Um, I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome to Navigating Academia for First Generation College Students. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and I'm just to quickly introduce uh, myself and my, my co-facilitator tonight. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Alsop. I'm the Academic Director of Communication and Media here at CUNY SPS. And I'm here virtually with Dr. Carla Marquez-Lewis, the Director of the Psychology Program, um, who is here, but having some trouble with her camera, as so many of us are in this, this Zoom era. Um, we're both really excited to be here with you virtually and to be doing this event um, after um, it got delayed, unfortunately, by Ida last week. So um, thank you so much for, for being here. Just a quick preview of the event tonight. We'll um, spend about 40-ish minutes on kind of our, our presentation, um, and then we'll definitely have at least 20 minutes for questions. So if we, if we finish presenting a little sooner, we'll have more time to discuss. Some of you did um, pre-submit questions, which was wonderful and great, and we'll take those at the end, and if we don't answer them in the course of, um, of the slideshow. And we're also really excited to take other questions you have. So please feel free to pop those in the chat um, uh, and or use the raise hand function during the, the Q&A portion and we'll try to get to everyone. Um, as we get started, I also wanted to assure you that we will be sharing um, a copy of this presentation with all the registered participants, along with a glossary of some of the terms we'll be talking about um, and some suggestions for further reading and, and some resources. So that'll all be coming to you um, probably within the next day or so. So no need to take um, copious notes. Um, you, can, you can count on getting a copy for yourself. So just to get started, um, in the spirit of our, our first slide here, um, this is an event for first generation college students, um, but not only for first generation students. Um, a lot of what we're going to say tonight, I think, will be useful or would be useful to all undergraduates trying to navigate the very non-intuitive um, spaces of um, higher education. Um, so, you know, as Dr. Marquez Lewis will say more about in a minute, academia can pose particular challenges for, for first generation students, um, which is a term, by the way, that is somewhat flexible. Um, so it can be used to describe undergraduates whose parents haven't completed a four year degree or maybe did so in a system outside the United States or who for any number of reasons may just have um, less knowledge or familiarity with, with college culture. Um, and just to give you, you know, some stats, um, since, you know, we, we, we love to do that in academia, nationwide numbers vary, but the National Center for Education Statistics, the NCES, reported um, around 2018 that approximately 33% or one third of undergraduates are the first in their families um, to attend college. At CUNY, um, you might be interested to know the number is somewhat higher. Um, so 44% of um, undergraduates enrolled in the 2018-2019 academic year um, were considered first gen or identified as first gen, um, a percentage that's remained fairly consistent since um, around 2012, and I think it was around 45%. So those are my stats to share. Um, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Marquez Lewis, um, who's gonna say a bit more before we get started. So welcome again to all of you and thanks for joining us. And again, I'm sorry that my video isn't working, but um, hopefully you can hear me just fine. So when we initially thought about um, you know, conceiving this event, we really wanted to speak to students who, who were probably going to be struggling with some questions um, about how to get through this very crazy um, culture and web of things that, that exist that we call academia. And some of the things that we know about first generation students is that they struggle with some particular things. So they often are less academically prepared. Um, that has nothing to do with intelligence, of course, um, or ability, but, um, but the preparedness that they come to college with. We know that first generation students tend to have less knowledge about how to um, fill out you know, forms uh, related to financial assistance or how to gather um, financial support for their academic journey. They tend to have a lot of problems acclimating to this academic culture that we're going to be talking about that can be really counterintuitive and not intuitive at all. Um, students can struggle with things like confidence, um, particular areas related to their own family dynamics, separation from family, and we're going to talk about what happens when people pursue this, this academic journey to advance themselves in terms of degrees, but what that does to a family dynamic, how that can separate people from um, their families and their communities. 
The support that they get from families can be varied. Um, part of that comes from not that their families don't want them to succeed or don't want to help them to succeed, but that they don't know the ropes um, themselves to be able to provide the support that's needed. And then the obligations um, that first-gen students tend to have outside of academia tend to be great. And then their educational pathways um, and expectations tend to have a lot of barriers. So we really wanted to talk about some of those things and really propose some um, solutions or resources that can help students um, succeed. Absolutely. So let me advance the slide deck here. Um, so yeah, just to kind of pick up on what Dr. Marquez Lewis was just saying, um, you know, why this event? And, you know, there are obviously a, a number of reasons, as, as we were just saying, but just to kind of highlight a couple more, um, I think one thing we wanted to do is, again, really normalize the first generation student experience and maybe the, the non so called non traditional student experience because, um, you know, academia is not what pop culture tells you it is, right? Um, we wanted to push back on certain myths of college going that I think are unfortunately still pretty prevalent and um, widely perpetuated by, by the media. This idea that most students are pursuing a bachelor, bachelor's level degree, they're 18 to 24, they're on residence at a leafy campus, they're able to devote themselves full time to study for four years, they're free of family and work obligations. You know, so here, just by way of illustration and for fun, I've included a still from um, one of my favorite <clears throat> campus movies, Legally Blonde. Um, so, you know, this is not the experience of most um, students in this country, right? And again, statistics suggest that anywhere or as many as 75% of undergraduates could qualify as, as non-traditional, depending on how you define that term. So really non-traditional non students are the norm, not the exception. Um, higher education is also, as Dr. Marquez Lewis was just saying, not intuitive. So um, we wanna kind of try to, with this event and hopefully others going forward, really demystify um, you know, a lot of the conventions that, that you'll encounter in, in higher ed and what's sometimes called the hidden curriculum. So these unspoken assumptions or rules that maybe no one is gonna tell you and that there's this kind of idea you're supposed to already know. Um, I think that culture, that, that set of assumptions can really discourage first-generation students in, in particular. Um, you know, just to give you an example, I was a very well-prepared student academically. And when I got to college, I didn't know what office hours were really for. I didn't think I was qualified to attend them. I thought I had to have something prepared before I went to go see my professor. Um, you know, and that's, again, um, we'll talk more about office hours in a bit, but that's just an example, I think, of how much is presumed rather than maybe explained explicitly to students. Um, we also, I think, both were interested in thinking about our own firsthand experiences. Um, I am not a first generation undergrad student, but um, I was a first gen grad student. And, you know, I remember having to continually explain to my extended family why I was still in school getting my PhD for years and years. And, um, you know, that again, that that question that, um, you know, of, of kind of how to navigate those those conversations with family. We also want to really normalize asking questions, because, of course, that's that's how we learn. Um, it's how we learn at every level of the profession. And, and I guess, you know, really that's common to any field. And we want, um, again, finally to empower students during an academic journey that I know can often feel arduous, probably especially, um, you know, uh, more so or never more so than during a pandemic. And someone will be referencing maybe later in this, uh, this presentation, a philosopher named Jennifer Morton, who has written about the ethical costs of, of upward mobility. Um, she's talked about how educational institutions are actually social institutions and that student success really depends on the relationships they form with professors and their peers and advisors. So we're trying to lay some of that, that social foundation here. Let me advance the slide for Ken. There we go. So as Dr. Alsop was saying, um, you know, being a first generation college student, you know, there are different levels of preparedness. I was a first generation undergraduate student. No one I knew had gone to college and going into um, the college environment was very disorienting. I had no idea what certain words meant. Um, I didn't know what a bursar's office was. Um, you know, you don't encounter a bursar very often in your everyday life. So one of the things that we decided to do is really just to start with some general definitions. And I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because we've created a working glossary for you that we'll send to you so that you have. But I do wanna to touch on just a couple of things that you may sometimes ask yourself as a first generation college student, am I the only one that doesn't know this? Um, or, 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 or does everyone uh, not know this? And 
you know, the chances are mostly everybody doesn't know it. Um, it's, it's not just you and it's not just first year, uh, first generation college students. These are foreign terms to a lot of people. Um, so prerequisites and co-requisites are probably a good place to start because these can present barriers to your path through um, your major. So prerequisites, of course, are um, you're going to see these a lot in the, the uh, catalog. And it's a course that has to be taken before you take um, the course that's, that's listed that you're looking to register for. And then the one that's a little more confusing to some students is a co-requisite. So these are courses that need to be taken together. Um, so oftentimes in, in psychology, for example, we have co-requisites with research methods and statistics. Um, so they're, they're courses that complement each other and that work well together. Um, the bursar, which I started out uh, talking about, this is the place that you go to to pay for things, right? Um, so there are the financial office that handles many of these financial aspects of higher education. Namely, you'll deal with them with student billing, uh, tuition matters, et cetera. Um, and then there are some other terms like advanced registration, which people usually refer to as this period of time during which students can register for the next semester. And then office hours, I'm gonna put a little pin in because we're gonna spend some time later talking a little bit more about office hours. Um, I just want to take a, a little quick, um, I guess, raise of your hands, if you can. How many of you have ever seen the terms ZTC or OER? Anyone ever seen that? Doesn't look like very many. Okay, a few, so that's good. Um, and that's actually very good because a lot of you haven't heard of that, and that's really the point of tonight is to, to let people know what these are. So when you go to register for classes, you'll sometimes see things then labeled as ZTC. And that stands for zero textbook cost. So for these courses that you take or, or may take, the course textbook won't cost you anything. Um, there may be costs though for other course materials, but often these courses are using what we call open educational resources, and that's that OER. So it means that these things are going to be available um, in the public domain, textbooks, readings, um, articles or journals or videos, um, things that are available to you and are licensed in ways that make them free um, for you to use. And so if you are on a budget, which many people are um, who are paying their way through school, these classes can be um, very helpful to students and very budget friendly. And you can search for them specifically um, when you look in, in the uh, course schedule. There are some majors, um, some degrees at SPS that are completely zero cost. So there are pathways through, at least through the major. So it's worth talking to your advisor about and they can give you more information and we're also happy to answer questions. Um, just a couple more things, um, student evaluations. These often are very intimidating um, to students who don't understand what a student evaluation is for. We want to hear from you. The best way that we can make your experience better and all students' experiences better is to understand what your experience is like. And so at the end of every semester, we ask for your feedback. And a lot of times students think that this is gonna affect their grade, um, your faculty members do not see this feedback until long after grades are posted. And so it's really a good opportunity for you to say what you have to say about what that experience was like and what could have been better. Um, it's very helpful to, to making the courses um, better for students. And we'll talk later about why it's so important to have uh, good feedback uh, going back and forth between faculty and students. And then the last ones um, are CUNY specific systems. Um, so I'm going, jumping back up a little bit. Um, CUNY has a lot of systems. Um, and so if you've been here, if, if you're new or if you've been here a long time, you're often in Blackboard, you're in CUNY First, you're in something called DegreeWorks, you're in eReserves. Um, there's a lot of these different systems and they can be very confusing and logging in can be very confusing. So we created a, a glossary and I think it, it's best to kind of let the glossary uh, walk you through because we put a lot of information about what logins you need for each of the systems and what each system is used for. So hopefully you'll find this um, at least a, a good place to start and kind of um, clarify some of these terms that, 
that you need to be able to navigate in academia and that can sometimes be a little opaque. Great. Um, well, kind of, I guess, sort of digging in now to sort of the nitty gritty. I know this is something that's always paramount on students' mind is, you know, how, um, how what are some best practices for actually succeeding in your classes? And, and um, here we're going to try to kind of highlight some, some of those and maybe also some obstacles to student success that we regularly see. Um, I think first, you know, this, this is a cliche for a reason, um, but the syllabus, uh, read it, download it, print it, know it. Um, everyone's going to have maybe their own, you know, uh, comfort level with with reading on uh, on a screen versus printing out. But I always recommend that my students, in whatever form they they engage with the syllabus, that they do annotate it, right? So they make notes about maybe important deadlines if they have questions about particular assignments. The syllabus is really kind of your roadmap through the course, um, and it's it is really crucial. And we'll I will um, try to illustrate that on the next slide um, in a in a humorous uh, way in a moment. Um, it's also really important to make sure that you have all the course materials you're, you're going to need for the class. And in some cases, that might be as sort of traditional as ordering your books and making sure I would add to do that with enough lead time. So, um, you know, I think particularly now we've noticed that deliveries have been delayed. It's really a good idea to, of course, order your books as soon as possible. And if you're concerned about that, it's even okay, and I encourage students to do this, to reach out to a professor, you know, um, the week before classes and try to, to get a jump on what the materials will be. And of course, you can usually see that too, listed with many courses. Um, ZTC courses are, means the zero textbook cost courses, means that you'll be able to access your courses, I mean, your materials either within the Blackboard site or sometimes through e-reserves, which is um, a page that Baruch Library, our sister library, sets up for individual classes. So you'll be able to download and if you prefer, print um, your readings directly from the site. I think it's a, it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it, it's important to know deadlines. Most um, of our online courses have kind of a rhythm to them. So some courses, um, you know, go from sort of, you know, uh, Monday to Sunday, others have a slightly sort of different weekly rotation, but you know, normally it's the case that you'll be kind of asked to do certain things on a regular, um, on a regular schedule, post to the discussion board by this date, respond by this date. Um, you'll wanna know when your major assignments are due and um, you know, kind of to that point, we'll talk a little bit more about time management, but if you're a, a person that uses a paper planner or a digital calendar, it's a really good idea to enter those deadlines in somewhere where you'll be able to refer to them easily, especially if you're taking multiple courses. You'll also want to make sure you have all the tools you need. And I'm going to say this here. I know it's it's really challenging, but I have students who have tried to do their coursework on their phones and it's it can work, but I'm not going to recommend it. It's really challenging. And, and so if um, if at all possible, we recommend having a laptop and SPS actually has a laptop loan program, which we'll we'll kind of refer back to on our last slide. Um, and you're probably going to need stable Wi-Fi, at least for, for um, moments where you're going to need to access your, your Blackboard sites. So make sure that you have those things. And if you don't have them, reach out. Reach out to the school. Reach out to your professor. Reach out to your program director, because we do have resources available to help students. I always recommend my students find some space. I know in New York, space is at a premium. Um, I work and live now in a two-bedroom apartment. So if you can't find a room of your own, which is relatively luxurious, try to at least find a desk or a nook or a chair. Um, I have a lap desk that I really like to use in, in my favorite chair and find the place that you think you're going to be most productive. Um, this kind of comes back to the syllabus, but no school policies about um, plagiarism, right? How to avoid it. And um, you know, that's, that's something we can definitely say more about if, if there are questions, but also accommodations. If you um, feel, if you are a student that has a disability or feel you would benefit from some kind of accommodation or have, have had a documented accommodation in the past, um, that's something that um, you know you should feel within your rights to to ask about. And this, I save this for last, but it's actually super important. Check your SPS email uh, because um, that's where you're going to get a lot of information, not only about your classes, but about um, resources and opportunities and events at the school. Um, and I, I, it's it's something that you should probably try to check. I would say at least once a day, um, but certainly regularly. So that's some some uh, sort of tested tips and tricks and back to that syllabus piece um you know professors i know um you know have regularly share with their classes these kinds of reminders to students about just how important the syllabus is so there's a whole um genre now of syllabus memes these are a couple of my favorites um i particularly like morpheus you know kind of menacingly um you know kind of glaring down at you and reminding you that it's that it's in the syllabus um but uh it is important so 
On to the next slide. Back to you, Dr. Marquez Lewis. So within academia, there's this that we, we called it professionalism, but really it's sort of this um this culture that, that is academia that you don't know walking into it. So a lot of times one of the things that confuses people is what to call their professors. Um, and some professors get offended. Um, you, you never know who you're gonna run into. Um, most are pretty flexible, but oftentimes the default is just to call someone professor, um, uh, unless you know, you're told otherwise, if you don't know if they're a doctor or what their, their title happens to be. Um, in each of the sites at SPS, we have a section called instructor information or contact information. And we try to make this a little bit easier for you where faculty introduce themselves to you and often they will tell you what they want you to call them. Um, and so it's best to oblige and to refer to them however they, they want to be um, referred to. Sometimes people abbreviate their names. You know, in my case, my name can be quite long for students, you know, Marquez hyphen Lewis. So students will just, you know, I tell them just to call me Dr. M or, um, you know, Professor M. So use that as a good rule of thumb. And whenever you send emails to students or to uh, faculty, it's best to start with a salutation, um, then write your message and then your sign off. What I get a lot sometimes um, from students, especially new students um, or students who, how, why would they know how, how they're supposed to email um, a professor, but or, or what might be the appropriate way to email, um, is just they just start in on a on a conversation. Um, so it reads more like a text message. Um, so you want to just formulate your message, you know, in a way that that adheres to kind of professional standards. Um, because you're going to get the best response that way. I think another really good thing for students, all students, but particularly students who aren't familiar um, with academia, is to assume good faith um, in their professors. Your professors are there as allies, and I know that sometimes it can feel like, um, you know, the you're intimidated or maybe you don't even like the professor. I mean, that, that happens occasionally um, as well, but they're there for you um, and they're there because they wanna help you succeed. So treat them as partners and it will make you know, the process a lot smoother. And a lot of times people don't know how to reach out to your professor. And the best way to reach out to them um, is to attend office hours. Office hours are gonna come up over and over and over again um, tonight, but attending office hours, I had someone um, attend at my five o'clock office hour and she just wanted to say hi um, and it, that was great. We ended up having a 10 minute conversation about what her expectations were for the class. And she told me a little bit about her, but now we have a connection that we otherwise wouldn't have had. And if she keeps coming to office hours, we'll develop even more of a connection. And those connections are going to be very important. And we'll talk more about the importance of uh, connecting with professors um, a little bit later. So the same goes for your classmates. They're a network for you and a learning community. So try to, to reach out and make connections. And I know that a lot of times that too can be intimidating, um, but they want your support just as much as you want theirs. So opening up a, a dialogue is wonderful. And in each of the courses in, at CUNY SPS, we have sections um, that are usually reserved for students to talk amongst themselves. Sometimes they're called student cafes. Um, and that's separate of the Q&A section. So, you know, put something in there. Other people will start to, to talk and then you can create um, a network there. And then another thing to keep in mind is being mindful of faculty status. Some faculty are full-time and some faculty are part-time. So if, you know, they don't get back to you in 12 hours, um, just be a little bit patient. Um, most of our faculty will get back to you within, well within 24 hours, but sometimes it can take just a little bit more. Um, if you don't hear from them, then feel free to email again. But what you don't want to do is send four emails um, back to back um, because, you know, it, it takes a little bit of time um, for people to, to get back to you. Many of our faculty are working professionals, you know, just like you. Um, and the goal is to get to know them, to develop relationships. Your relationships with your faculty are going to be some of the most important um, factors between whether or not you succeed um, or not. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. 
Okay. Oops, sorry. Let me, there we go. Um, time management and self-care. Oh, I mean, I think we could probably have a whole uh, webinar about this topic. Um, I know it's something that I personally struggle with, even at this point in my career, right? The, the elusive uh, life work balance. But I do think that there are things that um, you can do that I've seen some of my students do to really help um, you know, manage the, the different competing obligations I know so many of our students have. Um, one is really to try to realistically scope your work. So one thing I do see sometimes students doing, particularly those who um, you know, maybe have less experience of higher ed previously, um, is to just take too many courses their first semester while they're holding on a full-time job. You know, I had a student try to do five classes one semester while she was working. And, you know, that's really kind of setting yourself up, if not for failure, then maybe not great success. So talk with your advisor, think realistically about how much time during the week you're going to have available to devote to your courses and, and kind of plan accordingly. Um, use, again, as I said before, calendars and planners. I have I mean, I don't even really want to show you a page I've written on, but I have an old paper planner right here, if you can kind of see it. Um, and that's just what works best for me. So try to sort of uh, take a little audit of yourself. What, what systems have worked well for you in the past? Um, you know, and what, what maybe could you try to help keep track of some of the, the, um, the, the tasks that you have to, to manage? Um, limit distractions. For me, this is such a big one. And I think for online students, it is too, because you kind of can't not be on your computer and there's just so, there's a whole world of distraction awaiting you. So I like to tell my students to take it out of the willpower realm or arena. And I do this myself. So I have a program on my, my Mac, I'm a Mac user called Mac Freedom that turns off my internet for um, a designated period of time. So if I need to get some writing done, I'll set it for 45 minutes and then reward myself, um, you know, with, uh, you know, kind of checking Twitter or emailing a friend or whatever it is, doing something I'm sure even, even less, um, you know, uh, embarrassing, more embarrassing. Some people like Pomodoro, which is a I think a 25 minute kind of clock you can set for yourself. So working in little bursts can be a really great way um, to make uh, progress, even on maybe especially on bigger tasks that you might otherwise be tempted to procrastinate on. So a lot of times with papers, students will come to me and say, well, I just don't know how to get started. And really the only answer is just to start, right? To start with the pre-writing. And of course there are other tactics we'll, we'll talk about, but I think um, find tools and tricks that um, that work for you. Oh, I see, yeah, the do not disturb option on your cell phone. Listen, if you need to take your phone and put it in another room, do that. I mean, I, I think that we're all living through an era of sort of unprecedented digital distraction. So um, take the measures that you need to take. And yeah, protect your time. Um, treat school like a job because it is a job, um, you know, for all intents and purposes. So, you know, don't let, I mean, it's hard, believe me, I know, but, um, you know, try to, to kind of designate time and um, you know really guard it jealously, kind of zealously. Don't don't let people kind of take it away from you or say, oh, it's, you don't really have anything to do. Then you do. Um, to that point, I think also set up routines. If you know that you're someone that is really productive in the morning um, or late at night, um, you know, try to to kind of you know make that time your your study and work time. And then I, I put this last, but it's also maybe should be first. You really need to take time for yourself, um, especially now. You need to rest, you need to physically move and exercise, you need to get good sleep. So don't let those things fall by the wayside. Um, oh, Heather's, yeah, confirming that phone in the other room works well. Same for me, Heather. All right, I'm gonna go on to the next slide here. So planning ahead is critical. Um, you wanna create a plan from the very beginning through your major, um, and planner sheets and degree works um, work really well. So degree works is one of those systems in CUNY that I talked about earlier and I said would be on the glossary. Um, that's really a, a way that you can track which courses you still have left to take, um, which ones, if you change your major, how will that change the configuration of your courses? Um, so creating a plan from the beginning is a really good way to to see the vision of, of what you're doing. So it has kind of that, that visionary um, piece, but it also is just a very practical document to get you through um, your program. Stack credentials when you can. Um, the first thing that I tell students in orientation um, is check the, the web page, and I give it to them for all of the minors that we have at SPS. You have a bunch of a collection of general electives in your major that you can do with them what you what you want. You can take courses and things that interest you. If you just take 12 of those credits and you concentrate them in one area, you can get a minor. So you can leave with extra credentials. 
um, that you wouldn't have otherwise had without any extra time. So being smart about how you stack your credentials, um, and we have other things like certificates and, and things that your advisor can help you with to be strategic about how you use your credit. And then work backwards. So try to think long-term about where you wanna be at, in the end, and then what you need to do to get there. For some students, that's going to mean graduate school, um, and other students, it's not. And there are plenty of careers that do not require a graduate degree. So you'll want to seek out resources. Your advisor is a good place to start. Your academic uh, director for your program is another good resource. Um, so that you can talk through what it is that you want to do, and we can help you to devise a plan to get there and what resources we can offer you. You don't want to wait until you get too far in um, and then realize that, oh, you should have done this, you could have done that, um, and, and wish you had done things differently. So in terms of graduate school, for those people who do want to go to graduate school, we have lots of resources for students who want to go on to a master's degree or a PhD. And when I say resources, I really mean in terms of informational resources, we're looking for other ways to support students as well. But we can help you with what courses you need and what exams and how to get recommendation letters and all of those things that can be very um, disorienting as well. So we have something called the Graduate School Preparation Series, and it has multiple um, talks one about preparing for graduate school, one about applying to graduate school, how to write a personal statement, which is one of the most important pieces of your application, and how to write a CV. Um, and some people don't even know what a CV is, and that's okay. Um, we'll talk through um, what a CV is and, and how you put those together. So those are this semester, and all of the academic directors participate. And so you get access to all of these people at, at one time um, to help you. So take advantage of those kinds of ways to plan ahead. So this section we really were thinking about in terms of the emotional piece. So there's the stuff that happens outside of your classes, right? Um, the resources and we'll We'll end with some resources. Um, there's the things that happen in your classroom. And then there's the emotional part. And that can be a very tough place for a lot of first-gen students. Um, the imposter syndrome, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, sometimes you'll hear it called the imposter phenomenon. It's really um, this finding that, especially people who are high achievers, they tend to doubt their own skills or their own talents or their own achievements. They have moments where they feel like they're a fraud. Um, they attribute how far they got to luck. So they, they got lucky and that's why they're there. And about 70% of people will encounter um, imposter syndrome at some point in their life. Um, I will tell you uh, just a little an anecdote. When I was in graduate school, um, I was working on a PhD and I was thinking, I don't know how I got here. Um, you know, and I remember sitting in my classes and thinking, I'm not sure who's gonna figure it out first that I'm really not smart enough to be here. Everybody in this room seems smarter than I am. And for whatever reason, I, in a moment of weakness, um, actually disclosed it to another student. And they said, wait, I thought I was the only one that didn't, that, that I was the person who wasn't smart in the class. All of you seem to know what you're doing. And then it was sort of a domino effect from there. Every single person in that, that group um, that included all of the PhD students who were going through at the same time I had had these same exact feelings. So why we mention it is because with first-gen students, we know that first-gen students tend to encounter this quite often, um, this feeling that they're in a... a foreign place that they're not supposed to be and that they somehow got there um, by luck or because people haven't figured them out yet. Just knowing that it exists, I think, is, is a start. And there are lots of resources that will provide about how to overcome um, imposter syndrome. And I do want to also say that, you know, Dr. Alsop and I are kind of running through all of this. We were thinking about this as like a Navigating Academia 101. But there are more talks to come. We want to do deep dives into all of these different topics. And one of them will be imposter syndrome and you know, how much it can really impact someone's life and, um, and how to overcome it. 
I think the other thing to really talk about is code switching. And code switching originally started as a linguistic tool that people who are bilingual used to use to switch between languages. But it's since then expanded to talk about people who exist in two different cultures, right? Um, and those cultures or subcultures can be lots of different things. In the context of what we're talking about tonight, it's really for first generation college students who are living in an academic world that is different than the world of their origin. So whatever their background um, ha happens to be, their family, their, their community, their friends. And that can be a very difficult space. Um, you know, we'll talk about what Morton says about ethical costs in just a second, but switching between two different cultures and environments is very taxing. It's taxing emotionally, psychologically, physically. And so I think it's important for first-gen students to understand and for us as an institution to understand how much of a barrier this can be when you are living between two spaces and moving between them and figuring out how to navigate that. And sometimes you can be in spaces where that make you feel really great. Your family is proud of you and they want you to succeed. And there's a lot of boasting and bragging about how you're in college and you're on your way to get a degree. But that is also a tremendous amount of pressure um, to place on someone. And a lot of first gen students struggle with feeling like they're going to fail. And if they fail, what does that mean um, for their family? Um, and, and that kind of pressure can take a toll. And there's also you know, this idea of disconnecting, right? And being two different people. Um, so we're gonna talk, we're gonna have a whole talk on, on this uh, type of existence, but we, what we wanted to do tonight was just acknowledge that it's there. And so if you feel this, um, you're not alone and, um, and it's normal and it's expected. And it's really, it's really our job as an institution to figure out how to support you better. Yeah, and on that note, um, I mean, I'll, I'll maybe kind of connect this a little bit to the, the point below about strengths, not deficits, and the Morton, but, you know, to Dr. Marquez Lewis's point, I mean, I think it's really important to um, recognize how much you, at first-gen students, do have to contribute in terms of prior expertise and, and lived experience and knowledge and to lean into that. You know, college is really different from high school. You're going to have an opportunity to shape your own research interests and, you know, allow those to be the drivers of, of some of the, you know, the projects you pursue. So it is, I think, incumbent on us as an institution, and I, I hope and I think that we do um, really value that experience, but um, but really recognize, recognize your strengths. Um, just to quickly pick up on, you know, this topic that I think really does merit a, a whole other discussion. Jennifer Morton is a philosopher who has written a book um, that will, again, we'll share with the resources, but she talks about how, you know, a lot of first generation students, low income students, non-traditional students, um, think about uh, the financial cost of attending college, but they're not always as cognizant of what she calls the ethical cost, which is kind of what's lost sometimes, um, the distance or the alienation that can result when, um, you know, a population she calls strivers, you know, try to, um, you know, return to college and, and take a different trajectory than, than others in their family may have taken. So that is a real, a real thing. Um, and one of the things we'll share in the resources is actually a talk that Morton gave, um, I, when she was actually teaching at City College, um, she's not there anymore. And I think it's really illuminating about some of some of these dynamics. But I know we're short on time now, so I won't get too into it. Um, should I just say something quickly about mentors and go from there? I think I will. Yeah. Um, so I think just you know, kind of to to kind of close this out and pick up on a theme that has emerged from from this presentation. It's really instrumental, I think, both to student success and their mental health to find. Um, you know, find mentors, plural, find those around them who want to help. And there are a lot of them. Um, and, you know, I think I had the idea when I was a student that I would find like one mentor who would guide me and tell me what to do. But that's often not how it works. Instead, you find a number of people who can advise you in different different areas of your um, of your academic experience and journey. And they're gonna be particularly instrumental um, in providing you with letters of recommendation, for instance, for grad school, which is something we'll talk about in the um, grad school prep series that Dr. Marquez Lewis mentioned. Um, along similar lines, you know, again, this idea of the social institution um, that is higher ed, you know, find friends, find fellow students you connect with, find, you know, get to know your professors, 
Um, academic Twitter is a whole nother thing, but it is a way of finding um, community, particularly for graduate students that can be very affirming. And although we're all very pressed for time, um, getting involved um, to the extent that you are able is a great way to connect, to network, to, um, you know, to again, feel that sense of solidarity um, with others, um, including other first generation students. And you know, keep attending events like this one. You know, this is um, we're we're gonna, as Dr. Marquez Lewis says, we hope to to offer more of them. Um, and in the spirit of resources, we just want to close this out before moving to questions by reminding you of all of the the pretty robust array of resources and supports that exist at SPS. And this is just kind of a short list. I'm not sure if it's totally exhaustive and. Um, you know, uh, these are, I think, some of the ones that I try to remind my students of most regularly, um, including, I think maybe I put writing fellows um, up at the top here because I know some students um, struggle with anxiety about writing and at the same time are often reluctant or hesitant to seek help with their writing. They feel maybe a sense of shame or some stigma. And I just really wanna remind everyone here that there is not only no stigma in using any of these services, um, they're really for you and they're partly funded by you in some cases by student activity fees or technology fees. So please do avail yourself of any or all of them as needed. Um, it's never too early to do things like seek out, um, you know, our career services office um, or, you know, to, to use our tutoring services, which as Dr. Marquez Lewis reminded me, um, are actually in some cases, um, they offer bilingual tutoring as well. So it's a really great resource. Um, and I'll hand things over to you just to say a bit more, Dr. Marquez Lewis, about a couple other things. Sure. So, I mean, I, I we want to sort of wrap up really by just reminding you that we're well aware that first gen students are not a monolithic group. You're you have other intersecting identities that are going to raise different barriers um, for you as well. So the intersection of race and gender and you know, SES and all of these things add additional stressors um, to the experience of first gen students. And, you know, these can be even exacerbated by real structural inequalities that exist in higher education. Um, a lot of students talk about, you know, not seeing faces if they're students of color that reflect their own and the disproportionate um, representation or under representation of particular groups, um, teaching courses, you know, the lack of inclusion that they feel sometimes, real racial traumas, um, microaggressions, things like that. So all of these things are additional things that we, we will be having talks on so that they can, we can help to support specific um, niches of students who are first-gen students who have other intersecting identities. And then I think we can never underestimate just personal and global challenges. I mean, that's, you know, broad spectrum, but there are going to be lots of other things that happen. We're, we're operating in the midst of a global pandemic. So everything that is already there has been exacerbated. All of the, the inequalities that already existed have been magnified. And that is also the case in academia. Students who can't afford to buy books, students who can't afford to take multiple classes because they have to work full time and all of these other things that are happening. So SPS is trying right now to really think about ways that we can support you. Um, some of the things that we've come up with, you know, are trying to assist students with navigating the process with their advisors or, you know, new financial programs to get students through and, you know, ways to develop personal relationships with students and encourage that between themselves and between faculty, you know, with office hours or small class sizes, um, you know, thinking about ways to support you with future pathways um, with the grad school series or first gen uh, speaker series. But in the end, I mean, all of this really is about you. So we know things about first gen students, but we don't know everything about first gen SPS students who are living through a pandemic and who are learning online, right? And so you're, you're an important group to hear from. And so um, Dr. Alsop and I are working on not just the speaker series um, for, for these talks, but also a um, first gen email uh, vanity email address and we'll send that with the resources that we send in the next year or two so that you can email directly um, questions that you have ideas that you have um, and we really want to open up a space to really hear from you and what your needs are. Um, and on that note hearing from you um, we would love to take questions and if there aren't any questions I can um, pivot to some of those that were pre-submitted I think some of them have been answered, but please feel free to put questions in the chat um, or to go ahead and raise your hand. And I think um, our events team should be able to unmute you. 
So feel free to um, to ask follow up questions about anything we said to bring up things we totally overlooked to uh, I don't know share resources we haven't thought of. And while everyone is brainstorming um, i'm going to pick up on one question that was just asked um, or was asked initially, which is what is the process like when it comes to finding a mentor. Um, I think that's such a good question. I feel kind of like a broken record in, in sort of emphasizing the importance of getting to know your professors early and interacting with them regularly. And, um, you know, I think as Dr. Marquez Lewis was just saying, that can be something as simple as not even, you could go to an office hour, even just saying an email and saying, hi, maybe, maybe you can't attend office hours, but you want to set up another time to talk, or you wanted to share a thought about the reading, um, you know, or to ask a follow-up question. Those are all great ways of starting to build a relationship. Um, and uh, it doesn't have to be, you do not have to have a, a great insight or a, a pressing, um, you know, question to initiate that kind of interaction. And I, I think that's, for me, in my experience, how I've often found, um, you know, mentorships and relationships that have endured. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Dr. Marquez Lewis. Sorry, I was muted. Um, no, no, I don't have anything else to add to that. Okay, great. Um, it looks like we got a question in the chat. Should our approach be different if applying for graduate programs, if choosing to stay online? What do you think? So are you asking whether the approach, the way you approach applying to graduate school or can you provide just a little bit more? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I'm not sure if, um, let me see who this was. Jor will be able to unmute. Maybe Jor, you could provide a little more information in the chat. Um, it says yes, in the communication process. Hmm. I, I would say it's, it's exactly the same. Um, so when you're applying to graduate school, whether you're staying online or not, um, the ways in which you communicate with faculty, the relationships that you develop, they're all going to be useful, one for having a mentor who's gonna help you get through that process, but also someone who can write you a really strong letter of recommendation. And a lot of times people just want a letter, right? Any letter. And what they don't realize is that it's not, important to have just a letter. It's important to have a letter that it is substantive, that has information about you and who you are and your academic abilities. So it needs to be someone who knows you well. And whether you're going to study in person or online, it's going to be just as important. Yeah, I just want to echo that. I mean, I often get um, sort of last minute entreaties from students who need a letter. And maybe I taught them for one semester many years ago. And I'm always happy to do it if I can, um, but that letter probably isn't going to be as strong as a letter from someone who has had a more sustained relationship with the student. Um, I see a question here in the chat about financial aid. Um, oh, sorry, I just got pushed down my, my chat here. Um, are there plans to help students financial aid that aren't qualified, that aren't qualified because they're above the income limit? You know, this is, um, I'm not sure I can speak to this here. I would definitely encourage one of the things on our list of resources is to get in touch not only with financial aid, but the scholarships office that we have at SPS. We have a really great team of folks there. Um, and I think some students don't know to reach out and to see what forms of support might be available. Um, is there anything else you would add to that, Carla? No, I would just say that, you know, we're lucky enough that we happen to have um, on online, um, although she she's just, um, a participant, but um, our, our bursar who also oversees scholarships. And um, so this is a really, you know, great place to, you know, to, to hear this question um, for her. But yes, there are lots of scholarships that are available to students and not all of them are need-based. Um, some of them are. And then we can also help you and, and they can help you. Um, but we can in the program as well with thinking about other ways uh, to be creative about how to fund your education. Um, there's lots of money that's left on the table outside of SPS and outside of CUNY um, through organizations. I mean, I'll just use one, for example, you know, if you bank at Bank of America, you know, they have scholarships that you can apply to and you can take those scholarships with you anywhere you go. So, um, you know, getting creative that way um, can, can be ways to, to fund your education, which is really a huge barrier um, for students. A lot of students don't finish because they can't afford to finish. And, you know, we never want that. 
you know, and CUNY does, you know, I think as probably some folks know, have really great programs like the ASAP program that have done a lot to try to eliminate some of those material extra costs of books and Metro cards. But again, that's that's not enough. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's such an important point. Ashley here has a, a really great and detailed question about um, the graduate application process and timeline, which Ashley, if it's okay, I'm going to um, kind of refer you hopefully to our, our preparing for grad school series, because that's exactly what we'll, we'll drill into there in more detail, I think. Um, so definitely make sure to, to come out to that event. Um, let me see what else we're getting a bunch. Oh, and our wonderful um, uh, uh, bursary office is offering some more information and links for folks in the chat about different forms of short-term assistance and scholarships as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, oh, now, of course, the questions are pouring in. Now as our minutes tick down. Um, Cy SM has a question. He says, as a student, or they say, as a student who faces immense pressure from family and relates incredibly to the code switching you mentioned, um, who may I reach out to or what resources are available to alleviate the stress and pressure and help chart my next steps? It's such a good question. Yeah. So, I mean, th this is, you know, this is the thing that keeps me up at night, right? Is thinking about how, how we help students navigate this space. It, personally, it was one of the toughest spaces to live in. I, I still live there um, and, and how, to, how to manage that. So it doesn't go away. It's just a matter of, of how, how you manage it. So I would say that First and foremost, you can reach out to one of us. Um, you, you're, I, I'll put my email address. You're welcome to reach out to me um, or to the, the first gen um, email address. And then also I'd encourage you to come and attend um, the next talk that we have specifically about code switching. And then we're gonna provide some resources in the next day or two. We really wanted to see what your questions were and where you wanted um, resources. We have our, our main list, but we wanna be able to add um, what you needed. So I'll add some more things on there about food switching um, and how to manage that. And, and you're right, it's stressful and it's a lot of pressure and um, we'll make sure that you, you know, get the support that you need. That's great. And it looks like there are actually a couple questions in the chat just about the application process for BA or maybe even to SPS. So um, I don't know if someone here could do it, but um, we, you, you, if, if not, again, you can absolutely reach out to me or Dr. Marquez Lewis, but um, there's a lot of information on the SPS um, admissions page about the application um, procedures. Um, so there are definitely folks who wanna to talk to you and, and help about that. I think I, I also just wanna mention here, I'm being reminded by a colleague that, um, you know, we do have wonderful counselors here at SPS, designated psychologists who are available to confidentially and for no cost to consult with students. So, you know, if you are feeling that stress and pressure, um, I mean, relate, I think a lot of people are feeling stress and pressure on all number of fronts, but um, particularly, um, uh, you know, for the reasons you mentioned um, or the, the student mentioned, please do reach out to, um, uh, again, SPS counselors. I think if you um, search for, you know, SPS, I don't have the link on the top of my head, but it's under student services. Um, Erin Jeanette is um, our head counselor and she has another colleague working with her. Um, so that's a really important resource to remember as well. Let me see, um, scrolling down here. Oh, this is a big question. Which would you say is easier online or in person? I'm going to assume that the student is talking about undergraduate school, undergraduate college. Um, that is, uh, again, a, a question we could really dig into. I think what I would say is that students often come in with the um, misconception that online is easier. Um, and in many respects, it is more challenging um, in the sense that it requires um, a lot of um, self-discipline, a lot of time management, as we talked about. There's no one that's gonna sort of, you know, force you to sit in a classroom for a certain number of days a week. Um, and so it, it can be beneficial um, for certain students, yes, lots of self-discipline, Christy, absolutely, to keep yourself on track. And of course, your professors um, can help with that, but, but a lot of it falls on the student. So, you know, I think it's important to do kind of an inventory of your own, um, you know, your own strengths and needs as a learner um, when making that decision. And that's something I'm always happy to talk to students. Sometimes I get questions from prospective students, um, and I try to, you know, kind of really talk through with them what it would look like for them to be in a fully online program. We also have a really great program at SPS called Test Flight that allows students to kind of go through the motions of what it would look like to be enrolled in an online class and kind of dip a toe in and see if it's for them or not. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Dr. Marquez Lewis? No, I mean, I, I think I would say also to always, um, you know, talk, talk to your advisors 
They have great rules of thumb about how many courses uh, students should take based on how many hours they're working. Um, you know, the general rule of thumb, um, I'll just put it out there, is it, you're probably going to plan on spending about nine to 12 hours um, on coursework per course per week. So, um, and then for grad programs, we say 12 to 15. So if someone's working full time, taking four classes is probably not a good idea. Um, so, you know, use those rules um, to help. And then your advisors often know the intricacies of different courses and they'll be able to say, do not take stats and, uh, you, you know, test and measurements or whatever course it happens to be together um, while you're planning your wedding or, you know, whatever happens to be going on in your life. So they can help you there manage those kinds of things. Yeah, and you know, we just got the exact same comment in the chat, nine to 12 hours per week for each class for online courses, right? So that's a good um, kind of barometer to use to, um, to kind of scope your work as we were talking about before. Um, Heather Zeman, our events manager, reminds us that the test flight course is currently running through September 14th. So she has a link there for it. Anyone interested in checking it out, which is great. Um, I think it's a really important way to, to get a sense of, of um, whether you'll enjoy online learning. Let's see, any other, I don't see any other questions in the chat unless I miss something. Um, I feel like we did get some pre-submitted questions that we touched on, but probably would not be able to resolve. One of them that I, I think kind of kept me up at night was um, about the pandemic's impact on first-gen yeah. students. And, you know, I, I, I wish I had a, a better answer for that. You know, it's, it's, we're all dealing with so much burnout. And then I think there's the particular forms of burnout we were maybe just referring to that may be uniquely impacting, um, you know, first generation students. And so we may need to, to leave some of those bigger questions for follow-up events. Um, but I don't know, uh, Dr. Marquez Lewis, do you have any thoughts about the pandemic? <laughs> Well, the, the APA, which is the American Psychological Association, the governing body, the professional organization for psychology, um, they just published a pandemic, uh, their pandemic report, um, sort of like the, the state of mental health um, in the United States, which you can probably guess is not good and, and won't be good for a very long time, but they have lots of tips and resources in there. And that is one of the resources that we have included on our list. So it's not a long read. Um, and it has some really great infographics as well. So it might be worth taking a look at, um, you know, in, to say what you can do um, rather than the, the how can we solve it? Because we're, we're still in it. Um, so, and, and we may not be out of it for a while as, as you know, I know that's not a, a great way to, to answer that question, but it is true. It's, it's hard to reflect on something when you're still moving through it, uh, but they do have some great tips. That's great. And I think that's on our list of resources, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, maybe to end on a slightly more optimistic note, since I think we're almost at time, um, you know, as a reminder, um, we will send out to you a copy of this presentation, um, the glossary that Dr. Marquez Lewis mentioned, and a kind of working bibliography of some readings and resources. Again, this is all a work in process, and we really welcome your input and thoughts um, and suggestions. So we're really open to hearing from you either at the um, vanity email, which we'll, we'll send with, we'll share with you as well, or at either of our personal um, addresses. I believe you can also email the events team with any questions that we didn't get to tonight because I realized we didn't get to all of them, I'm guessing, um, but we're so thankful for everyone that showed up on this rainy Thursday. Uh, there's the um, events at sps.cuny.edu email right there. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us. And um, yeah, I, we really hope to, to see you at future events. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Oh yeah, and our grad school prep series, we're getting reminders, sign up. <laughs>